Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us on today's episode of A Cancer Conversation with the Georgia Cancer Center at Augusta University. My name is Chris Curry, and I am the Communications and Marketing Manager here at the Georgia Cancer Center. I want to thank you for taking the time to listen or watch today's uh, episode of A Cancer Conversation. Today's discussion is going to focus on melanoma and other types of skin cancer. Obviously, it's starting to get warmer out there, longer days, warmer temperatures, more people spending time outside. So we wanted to sit down with Dr. Harold Rabinovitz to discuss skin cancer, its risk factors, prevention, screening, and what happens if you're diagnosed with one of those types of skin cancers. So Dr. Rabinovitz is a medical dermatologist and a faculty member from the dermatology department at Augusta University Health and maintains a private dermatology practice in Southern Florida. Dr. Rabinovitz, we appreciate you uh, taking the time for today's conversation. Thank you very much. All right, um, so let's get started. Let's talk a little bit about you. Uh, you are the, 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 the subject matter expert here. Talk to me about your history uh, working in the field of dermatology. So my background was during medical school, like any medical student, you're really not sure what you want to specialize in. But while I was at Princeton, my favorite courses were actually in art. And in art, you see many different patterns. And I learned that dermatology is all based on pattern recognition. So when I decided that dermatology was the area that I wanted to specialize, I did my training up at New York Skin and Cancer. And I then did a fellowship in Mohs Surgery, which was very, very early. We're talking back in the early 80s where there were a few Mohs surgeons, went down to Florida and specialized in Mohs surgery, which is one of the methods that we use to treat non-melanocytic skin cancers, basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. And now we actually use it to treat early melanomas on sun-damaged skin on the face. About 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I embarked on a new journey in the area of cancer and that was with various imaging devices. And the imaging devices, which were very early on used, were actually magnifying lenses. Handheld scopes, when applied to the skin, make the outer layer skin clearer so you can see patterns and structures that you can't see with your naked eye. And those are called dermatoscopes. And dermatoscopes became my passion, and other imaging devices have followed. So my passion for the evaluation of patients with skin cancers is one based on new imaging devices and two on the ability to diagnose skin cancers earlier which gives patients a better hope to completely remove this without any potential recurrence. And you talk about the dermatoscopes and the handheld microscopes. I'm sure that you have seen technology evolve oh, yes. over the last 25 years. Very much. <laughs> um, so. This episode is for May, which is uh, Melanoma and Skin Cancer Awareness Month. We're gonna be sharing information on the Georgia Cancer Center's social media channels all month about melanoma and skin cancer. So everyone relates skin cancer with sun exposure, but what different risk factors are common for skin cancer? Sun is, sun is only one of the risk factors. Other risk factors include the patient's complexion, individuals with blue eyes, fair skin, many years of sun exposure, are all risk factors. Another important risk factor is your genetics. There are certain individuals who have mutations with their genes, which make them more prone to developing skin cancers, whether it be basal cell carcinomas, the so-called basal cell carcinoma nevus syndrome, whether it be with individuals with melanomas who have multiple melanomas due to a specific mutation. So genetics play an important role as well. We also know many years ago that we used to treat many dermatologic conditions with radiation for acne, for psoriasis. 20, 30 years later, those individuals developed multiple skin cancers. And that's what's called iatrogenic medicine, individuals who actually had treatments and then ultimately developed skin cancers because of it. Back in the old days, they used to use arsenic as an herbicide. 20, 30 years later, we see all the destruction from arsenic ingestion from these herbicides, which cause multiple skin cancers as well. So the risk factors are many. Okay, 
And one thing that I read doing my research that I hear kind of talked about a lot is it's not just Caucasian people who are at risk of skin cancer, even African Americans and other ethnic minorities also do have a risk of skin cancer. Is that right? Yes, and that's true. So for example, in individuals which we call Fitzpatrick 5 and 6 skin, these are individuals who are heavily pigmented. The number one cause of melanoma in this particular population is on the bottom of their feet. That really? Is, yeah. So that is individuals who are very dark complected, they will can uh, develop melanomas on the bottom of their feet. They're called acromelanomas. Approximately 70% of melanomas in Mexico are on the bottom of their feet. So different individuals have different risk factors uh, depending on their complexion as well. Okay, well thank you for that information. That's, uh, that's very interesting, I did not know that. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Let's talk about testing in skin cancer. So what type of skin cancer and what kind of testing can help determine the form of skin cancer someone has? So when we talk about skin cancers, we talk about melanocytic skin cancers, that is cancers derived from the melanocyte, and those are melanomas. And then we talk about the non-melanocytic skin cancers. And the non-melanocytic skin cancers are basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. Now the basal cell and squamous cell carcinoma of the non-melanocytic neoplasms are actually not as devastating uh, if caught early, uh, and even when they're caught a little later, it's not the same impact as a melanoma. All three skin cancers are derived from the outer layer of the skin, the epidermis. The bottom layer of the epidermis is called the basal layer, and normally the basal cells divide into what are called spiny or squamous cells and ultimately die. For all the mentions, things we spoke about before, the blue eyes, the fair skin, and all those other risk factors, when these cells don't die and grow uncontrollably, we call it a skin cancer. If they resemble the basal cell, we call them a basal cell carcinoma. If they resemble the cell type, which is a spiny or squamous cell, we call it a squamous cell carcinoma. And when it resembles the melanocyte, we then call it a melanoma. Those are the three most common skin cancers that we see. All right, um, let's talk about what sort of treatment options there are well, let's first, before that, let's talk about how we diagnose them. Okay, that is, well, in terms of diagnosing them, uh, there are many different ways. So let's first talk about the non-melanocytic skin cancers, the basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. We'll put them in one category. With our eye, our accuracy is about 80%. We do much better with the non-melanocytic skin cancers. With the little handheld microscope, which I mentioned before, they have distinct patterns and features which enhance our diagnosis from say 80% to 90 or even 95%. Uh, it's one of the most important ways to diagnose skin cancers is with those hand microscopes. There's another device which is used as well. It's called the confocal microscope. It's actually a laser beam which when it hits the skin gets reflected back into a computer screen where you see the layers of the skin live. It's almost like virtual pathology. Oh, wow. And for basal cell carcinomas on the face, you have a young person, someone in their thirties or forties, you talk about a biopsy, they go, I think uh, wait six months. With this particular device, you can actually tell the person with extremely high confidence that it's a basal cell or not by using this particular device. That's the confocal microscope. That's the confocal microscope. So we like to think of the dermatoscope as the stethoscope of the skin and the confocal microscope as the ultrasound, the Rolls-Royce treatment in terms of evaluating individuals for skin cancers. Squamous cell carcinomas as well has specific features. They have a specific pattern. We actually, if we look with a little hand microscope, we see it's just characterized by these small little red dots. It's pathognomonic for squamous cell carcinoma in situ. Melanoma is a different category. For melanomas, your accuracy in terms of distinguishing a melanoma from just a mole which has some unusual features is only about 60%, which is like going to Las Vegas to play black. <laughs> so the dramatoscope increases your yield to about 80%, the confocal increases to about 90%, but the real paradigm of change will be over the next couple of years where artificial intelligence will be able to aid the physician in making the diagnosis and help evaluate these patients with our eye, which is often not as good as with these other devices. Okay. Um, 
And then what treatment options are available for people diagnosed with skin cancer? Is it one treatment for all three types or are there different treatment options? Right, so again, we like to divide these into the non-melanocytic, the basal cell and squamous cell carcinomas. And for the basal cell and squamous cell carcinomas for early skin cancers, they can be treated many ways and many ways successfully. They can be treated with what's called a curette, which is this instrument, which is oval, one sharp edge, and you literally can scrape the basal cell and squamous cell away. Uh, and then afterwards, you heat the area with a cautery, so it's almost like a, a, a melting iron. And the cure rate is anywhere from 90 to 95% in selective areas. Another way we manage skin cancers in areas which are a little more difficult to treat is sometimes just with an excision. But when you do an excision and you need to send this into the pathologist to make sure that the margin's clear, uh, you need to take a good margin around it if you're on the face. Not so easy to do because you're gonna give that individual a relatively larger score. So another option is a procedure. It's called Mohs surgery. Mohs surgery is the Rolls Royce to treat a skin cancer in selective areas. It's actually a method where you numb up the area, you cut out the tissue, uh, you then take this tissue instead of sending it to the lab, you process the tissue while the patient is there. So you cut out the tissue, you take this tissue, you flip it over, you cut it into smaller pieces, you have a corresponding picture of the area, you freeze the tissue and make slides looking at the entire skin edge and undersurface. Normally the surgery takes about five minutes, about 45 minutes to an hour to process the tissue. If it's clear, you're done. If it's positive, you go back and you continue to do that to get the area free. Once it's free, there's a defect. And very often, the Mohs surgeon will do the repairs or work in conjunction with the other specialists, whether it be a plastic surgeon or a head and neck facial reconstructive surgeon, depending on the extent of the skin cancer. And the final method that we use to treat skin cancers is with radiation therapy. It's another modality which is very, very good, particularly for patients who can't have surgical procedures. So there are many ways that we treat both basal cell and squamous cell carcinomas. Now, melanoma is just a little different for melanomas. Whenever possible, uh, you want to surgically excise it. And normally, if it's a very early melanoma, we use much thinner margins than if it's an invasive melanoma. So if it's a thin melanoma, they can be cut out with smaller margins. The invasive melanoma, there are wider margins that are used. Uh, in addition, on the facial areas, it's one of the other areas where we have often melanomas on sun damaged skin because not all melanomas are the same, they all have different genetics. But for melanomas on the sun damaged areas of the face, most surgery, in my opinion, is actually the Rolls Royce treatment. We've got two most surgeons here at the Cancer Center who are exceptional and use most surgery for this particular type of melanoma all the time. Okay. Um, one question I had while, you, while you've been talking that I, I thought of is, are there parts of the body where skin cancers are more common? Yes. So skin cancer is more common in the sun exposed areas. Uh, the face, the arms, um, uh, the ears, but skin cancers can occur anywhere. So when patients come in for a skin cancer screen exam, they need to get a complete exam, and all areas of the body should be checked. Okay, good to know. Um, let's talk about how someone can reduce their risk of skin cancer. Okay. Well, sun protection is the most important. And in terms of sun protection, there are various sunscreens uh, on the market that can be used. Essentially, there are two types of sunscreens. There are what are called mineral sunscreens, which contain either zinc oxide or titanium dioxide. Uh, these are the sunscreens that we traditionally recommend. Uh, sunscreens that are also used are what are called the chemical sunscreens. And the chemical sunscreens are what are the, uh, contain the aerosols. They contain what are called the avalon oxybenzones. There is some debate whether or not the avalon oxybenzones have an effect on the coral reefs. There are other individuals who don't think that's true, that they think that the coral reef damage is actually due to uh, climate change and to global warming. Uh, so those are the two types of sunscreens that are used. Uh, we usually recommend the mineral sunscreens at this moment in time until this debate is finalized. Mm -hmm. But as you know, debates are never finalized. <laughs> yes, that is true. Um, so we're talking about sunscreens, oh, the two yes, different kinds. Yes, I forgot, I'm sorry. No, that's so okay. the other thing that, uh, particularly for patients with, with, uh, with extensive sun damage, 
Uh, a squamous cell it does not evolve as a squamous cell. Very often it, grow, it evolves as these fine little scaly areas, which are actually precancers. We call them actinic keratoses. And over time, they evolve into squamous cell carcinomas. Okay. So for those types of individuals, taking vitamin B3, vitamin B3, niacinamide, also known as nicotinamide, not niacin, it's a different vitamin three, B3, okay. reduces precancers by about 20%. Really? So, yeah, so for our patients who have sun damage, who have histories of vagal cells and squamous cells, we strongly recommend that. Okay. Another uh, point is, is that there's actually a plant extract in a pill form which gives you a sunscreen protection of about a four to six. Really? So yeah, so that, 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 so there are things out there which can reduce uh, your exposure. Um, not only sunscreens, you can get sun clothing. Um, a hat gives you an SPF of about a four to six as opposed to most clothing. Uh, you can get uh, sunscreen clothing now. It has to do with the way the uh, clothing is made in terms of uh, how the um, the fabric is produced okay. um, and um, and that's for um, for the most part in terms of preventive things uh, what we recommend okay I have seen those uh, those clothing those different kinds of clothing in different stores the hiking, yeah it's very very popular yeah um, so let's talk a little bit more about sunscreen because you mentioned there were two types I know a lot of people always talk about what's my SPF, what SPF should I wear? What is SPF and what's kind of the current recommendation? So SPF refers to the sun protection factor. And it actually is a factor which measures the amount of radiation in the UVB range. We know that radiation in the UVB range causes redness of the skin. And it's the UVB range which we believe is associated with skin cancers. Okay. So a sun protection factor of 30 will block out about 97% of the UVB radiation. Okay. A SPF of 50 will block out 98%. Okay. An SPF of 100 will block out 99%. Most dermatologists, including myself, recommend sun protection factors of anywhere between 30 to 50. Okay. You don't need 100, and they are more expensive and there's just no reason for them at this moment in time. Okay. Um, how often should someone reapply a, a 30 versus a 50? No different. Okay. okay. And usually we recommend if, you, if you're exercising and you're outside to apply them every two hours, two to three hours. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, in Georgia, how common is skin cancer? Extremely common. So um, there's no real good data in terms of for basal cell and squamous cells. Uh, but for melanoma, there were about 3,400 new cases of melanoma in Georgia with approximately 200 deaths. Okay. Now, in terms of from a, from a national point of view, uh, there were approximately 5.4 million basal cell and squamous cell carcinomas and about 100,000 new cases of melanoma and approximately 7,300 deaths. Okay. Uh, melanoma accounts for about 70% of deaths due to skin cancers, and melanoma uh, at this moment in time, it was going up rapidly, but it seems to have leveled off. Okay. Um, talk about, so the Georgia Cancer Center, we have this program that we are um, doing now called Teledermatology in Rural Georgia. Talk about how that program is uh, dedicated to doing more skin cancer screenings in cities and towns across the state. Okay. So. <laughs> Very often, it's difficult to get access to specialists. And in many areas in rural Georgia, your closest dermatologist might be 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 miles away. Okay. And in these rural practices in Georgia, they don't have access as opposed to the urban areas. So a project is underway where family practitioners in rural areas are given a Dramatic, are given a iPhone, okay. and they're given a dermoscopy device which attaches to the iPhone, and they take an image and in real time send it here to the cancer center and advise the family practitioner in terms of how to manage this particular lesion. Okay. And it's the new paradigm as well in terms of being able to provide care in rural areas where access is not available. 
The other important component is, as part of the project, is to educate the family practitioners as well. And there are lectures that are online, part of the Georgia Cancer Center, where family practitioners can listen to these lectures and actually get CME credits for it, uh, and expose themselves so that at any point in time, they'll be able to do dermoscopy, they'll be able to do, evaluate these lesions no differently than myself. In fact, in Australia, there were only 200 dermatologists in the entire country. And, okay. fa and family practitioners were pulling their hair out because they couldn't get their patients into dermatologists. Yeah. So they picked up the mantle of dermoscopy and they started learning dermoscopy and they formed their own dermoscopy clubs okay. and their dermoscopy societies. And they are some of the world's experts with dermoscopy. They have some of the major articles in peer-reviewed journal. Right there in Australia. They, right there in Australia. And they call themselves skin cancer specialists. Okay. Now the dermatologists um, dropped the mantle in that particular way. And dermoscopy and educating family practitioners is no different than educating anybody. And they can pick up the mantle and do this themselves. Okay. okay. Um, if someone is able to come to Augusta University Health, the Georgia Cancer Center, to see a skin cancer, a, a dermatologist, what can they expect when they get here through their appointment process? So, first of all, they'll get the best care in the United States. Absolutely. Uh, the second thing is that they will be referred to dermatologists because that's the first step. That's the screening. Uh, the screening to evaluate them from head to toe to make sure that they don't have a skin cancer. And if they have a skin cancer, uh, or a possible skin cancer, a suspicious area, a biopsy is performed. Depending on the biopsy determines how it then is managed. Now, from that point of view, for the most part, it is managed by the dermatologist. But if we have an aggressive skin cancer, then we talk about the multidisciplinary care, which is part of the cancer center. That is, whether it be the head and neck surgeon, or the surgical oncologist, or the radiation oncologists. We all work together to provide the best care for patients, whether it be an advanced squamous cell carcinoma, an advanced basal cell carcinoma, or an advanced melanoma. And I guess one of the biggest uh, things to advocate here on the, the podcast is always having that conversation with your family practitioner, your primary care provider. If you notice any changes in your skin, Absolutely. All right. Well, Dr. Rabinovitz, I appreciate you taking the time today to, uh, to sit down with us and to talk about melanoma and other skin cancers. Um, this has been very informative. Um, I want to thank all of you for, for listening or watching today. Uh, please hit that subscribe button on the Georgia Cancer Center's YouTube channel. Uh, you can also find us on Apple Podcasts. And uh, the rest of y'all have a great day. Have a nice day.